Okay, so it's time for the next lecture in our module on data management, visualization, and reproducibility. And we're still talking about this management and manipulation piece, and we're going to be talking now about tidying your data. Okay, so what are our goals for data manipulation as data scientists? Well, we want to be sure that we're manipulating all of our data in R. And this is really important because it preserves data integrity. So it allows you to go from your raw data to any sort of cleaning to your final analysis all in, in one set of code. Um, and that's important because it allows you to recreate anything that you do. And it also allows you to find any mistakes you might have made. Um, this happens quite a bit and it's much easier to find this these mistakes if you have just put it in your code and not actually influence the raw data files somewhere stored on your computer. And this will take a lot of time at first, but it's really worth the effort. Um, it, you know, the only way to get better at this is to practice, and you know, it, it can feel really tempting sometimes to try to, to manipulate things in Excel because, you know, you can just do it really quickly. Um, and so you have to balance your time, right, for learning and for getting stuff done. But I will say, hopefully, you can use this course to really take some time to practice these uh, these sets of code. And remember, Google is your friend throughout all of this. I don't have any of this memorized. I Google pretty much the, every function every time, copy and paste it and edit it because I just cannot keep this in my head. So you're, if you can't remember, you can always look back at this code, of course, from the lectures, but just Google is your friend. And so looking back at our, you know, our sort of schematic for all of this, working in Tidyverse, we're going to be talking right now about tidying your data with Tidy R. And so there's lots of ways to represent the same sets of data in tables, um, but they're not all tidy. And so here's an example of three different ways to represent the same data set. And these are, this is data from tuberculosis cases in 1999 and 2000 from several countries from the World Health Organization. And if you load your tidyverse package, you can actually look at any of these tables by just typing in their names. Um, they're automatically loaded in, so you can redo any of this analysis and you don't need the data. It's in the Tidyverse library. So what are the tidy rules? To have a tidy data set, there are three rules that your data must meet, and they're interrelated. So the first is that each variable must have its own column. The second is that each observation must have its own row. And the last one is that each value must be in its own cell. Okay, so let's take a look at these three data sets again, these three tables, and tell me which one of these tables is the tidy one. And if you guess table one, you're correct. That's the tidy data set. So here you can see that each variable is a column, and those are country, year, cases, and population. And each observation, which is a country within a year, is a row. And the data are in the cells, and those are your values. So why is tidy data useful? Well, it's really helpful to pick a consistent way to store data. And so if you always store everything in a tidy format, that means it's much easier for you to work with in the future once you get used to all this, these sets of functions. But also, R is a vectorized language. So when you put your variables in columns, um, the way th the way that we you structure it with a tidy data set, R is at its best. And so this allows you to be the most efficient with your R analysis. Um, yeah, so R really likes long data. Of course, we're going to be talking about various ways to use wide data as we move forward, but, but long data is really how um, R functions the best. So how do we create tidy data? So most often your data will not start as tidy because it's often organized in a format that's easiest for collection and entry, right? You want to cram as much as you can into some sort of spreadsheet that you create for yourself for collecting data. So once you've entered it in that way, you must tidy it. And so there's two important functions we're going to learn. And these have changed names over the years, um, anywhere from melt and cast to spread and gather, and now they're pivot uh, longer and pivot wider. So just keep your eye out for those other names in case you see them. Those are just older versions of these functions. And so pivot longer is when some of the column names are not the names of the variables, but the, actually the values of the variables. Um, and so that really equates to taking a wide data set and making it long. And then pivot wider, uh, that's 
a function you often use when an observation is scattered across multiple rows. And so that allows you to take data in its long form and turn it to wide, which is often represented in community matrices or um, if you're thinking about sets of amino acids, etc., all within a bunch of variables within one sample. So let's go over pivot longer first. Here, the column names are not the names of the variable, but the values of the variable. Um, and so what that means is looking at this table, table 4a, you can see that uh, 1999 and 2000 are both values of the variable year. And so the column names 1999 and 2000 really should be in a row itself uh, named year. And so for pivot longer, here's the code you're going to use, but let's first go over some of what these symbols mean. So in the tidyverse, you can combine multiple operations with a pipe or this percent sign greater than percent sign. And this is really useful. Um, it's a really useful way and why the tidyverse is so great is it makes your code clean, but also more human readable. Um, and you can take that pipe and translate it to the word then. So what this is saying, um, above is that you take table 4a, then pivot the columns 1999 and 2000 into one longer column named year, and its value should be called cases. And so the, the implementation of tidyverse has been really helpful for making, allowing you to do multiple operations at one time and being able to read those op operations like a sentence. And so let's see what happens if we actually try it. So I've printed table 4a at the top, so you can see the before, and then you use this pivot longer code, right, where you do the pivot longer and you're saying we want to concatenate that 1999 and 2000 columns and turn it into one column named year with the values ca in, called cases. And then you can see the output um, here on, on the bottom. And to remind you, the names too is the name of the new column that will form from the multiple old ones. And the values too are the observations that will fill this new column. That's the, that's the name of that new column. And so this is what just happened. You took your wide data and table four, that should be table 4a, and you made it longer. And so the counterpart to pivot longer is pivot wider. And this, you want to use this function when observations are scattered um, across multiple rows. And so here, for example, the data from Afghanistan in 1999 is in multiple rows. So, right, you see rows one and two, um, you have two different types, both cases and population, and those both have values. And so you really want to make that uh, into multiple columns. And so let's try it. Let's take that first uh, tibble and print it. And then we're going to pivot that table to wider and we're going to take names from the type column. So the type is where we want to take that one column and split it into two. And then we're going to get our values from count. So those are going to be the values that fill. And then you can use print here to print what you want. And n equals four allows you to just print four rows. And here the names from um, is the column with the variable that will spread to two columns. And the values from is the column of values that will spread into those two columns. And so what you've done here is taken your long data and turned it into a wide format. And sometimes it's easier just to sort of visualize it with this. So another useful function that gets used a lot in tidying your data is separate. And this pulls apart one column into multiple columns whenever a separator appears. So here you can see in our first table, table three, um, that you have a column of, called rate, and that is two numbers separated by a slash. And so you can use separate and um, specify col the column you want to separate out. You tell it what you want your columns to go into, right, cases and population, and then you have to tell it what the separator is. So here we're specifying that the separator is that backslash. And then you get the resulting table. And if you look carefully, the resulting table from the previous set of, of operations resulted in two new columns that were both characters because the original column was a character before the separation. So if we go back, you can see on that bottom table that cases and population are actually both characters, even though those values are integers. 
And so if you want to deal with that, what you need to do is add the convert equals true to the end of your separate function. And this, and then R is smart enough to know that those are actually integers, and so it will convert them um, from characters into integers. And so another useful function is the unite function. And as you can imagine, it turns two columns into one. And the default for this, um, it requires a separator, um, and the default for that is sep is an underscore. So if you want something different, you're gonna have to specify, as we'll show you below. And so here you can see a table that has the year 1999 separated into century and year, so 19 and 99. And you may just want that as 1999, one year is easier to, to manage. And so what you'd wanna do is take that table and unite um, the values into a column called new, so that's your new column, and it's gonna, you're gonna unite cent, the, column, the previous column, century and year, and you're going to separate that by nothing because you want no space there. And so that's just two quotes with nothing in between. And as you notice in your resulting table, you have two columns, new and rate, and they're both characters. And as we learned previously, you're gonna have to um, write, ha add that convert equals true if you want that new column to be an actual integer, which it is for years. Okay, and so missing values are something that you need to think about, especially when you're entering your data. So missing values can have different, mean different things. A zero can be different from an NA, can be different from nothing. And so it's important to think about this as you're tidying your data. And so your, your NAs, your missing data can either be explicit when they're flagged with an NA, or they can be impl implicit, not present in the data at all. And so we're gonna go through what that means. And so here we've created a, a tibble called frogs that has three columns, one for year, individual, and mass. And you can see in the mass column, there is an explicit NA. So in the year 1999, for individual number four, we didn't capture them and, and measure their mass for whatever reason, And although they were captured in 2018. And so there is an NA um, in the mass column. And you can see when you print out that frogs that that NA shows up as a value in the mass column, yet in even though those are characters, it's still um, an integer. And so in our case here, you can make though you can make implicit missing values become explicit by pivoting the years into the columns. And so you can take your frogs and pivot it wider um, with the names from years and the values from mass. And you can create a new tibble where you have the years in 2019 and 2018 with your individuals each as a row. And you see that in fact, while it looked like there was only one NA before, there were actually two. One was just implicit, but now they're both explicit. Or if these missing values are not important, you can turn these explicit values into implicit ones by using the values drop NA equals true. Kind of a mouthful, but you can find this in, in the documentation for these functions, pivot wider or pivot longer. And so here, if you take frogs, pivot it wider, and then pivot it longer, you go back to a, a data, data frame, a tibble where you have um, all implicit NAs. And we use a little fancy coding here with this, uh, 2018 colon 2019, and that's just another way of specifying that first part where it, you concatenate 2018 and 2019. I thought I'd show you that, although I really prefer the first version. And you can also then take this data set we've just created, and you can, again, make those missing values explicit with the complete function in case you wanna be able to count rows or something like that, and so you can use frogs, and then you wanna complete uh, year an individual, and that allows you to see which masses you have an explicit NAs for.